great pleasure to welcome you all here. This is a session which will feature a book launch, uh, Vivek's new, Vivek Chandra's new book, Ghachar Gochar, is that is the pronunciation right? Ghachar Gochar. And uh, the panel features Vivek Shandak, Mahesh Rao in conversation with Jayant Kaikini. I leave the floor to you. The only thing with these mics is you need to speak like this. The minute you do that, it cuts the... Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure to be able to celebrate today the launch of this very uh, gorgeous book, Gachar Gochar by uh, Vivek Shambhal. I, um, <clears throat> I started reading it yesterday actually, and I finished it this morning, and it's sort of been ringing in my head right through, um, right through the morning hours and up to now. Um, it's, I'll tell you about its minor virtues first. Um, it is 110 pages long. And, you know, I mean, I think we can all agree that, you know, in these days when we have so many um, demands on our time, you know, a short book and a short, wonderful book like this is just, it's just, it's just the ticket. The other thing is that the publishers, HarperCollins, have given it this wonderful cover, um, which, um, it, it's wonderfully evocative, but it, it, it also means that the cover designer has read the book because they've picked one of the strongest metaphors in the book to put on the cover. So I'm, I'm delighted with that. So, so moving to the introductions, um, Vivek Shanba here is the author of the book, um, uh, writes in Canada and has published five short story collections, three novels, two plays, and also edited two anthologies, one of which is in English. Um, uh, his stories have been translated into English and many other uh, Indian languages. And uh, some of his stories have been adapted for the stage. Uh, one of them, Nirvana, has also been made into a short film. And Vivek also founded and edited the uh, pioneering Kannada literary journal, uh, Deshkala. And um, he lives in Bangalore. Um, also lives in Bangalore. Uh, Jayant Kaikini, who uh, Vivek told me this morning that if he walks down the streets of Bangalore, he just gets mobbed, you know. So I feel like I'm, I'm doing him a disservice by even introducing him here, but, but, but we must. So, so Jayant Kaikini, who is a poet, short story writer, playwright, film lyricist, and also this, uh, this detail uh, made me very happy. He's the, he's the, he's the winner of uh, four State Sight Academy Awards for his uh, novels, but he's also the winner of two Filmfare Awards for his work in film lyricism. So, so it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to um, this full-on Karnataka panel, uh, you know, uh, on the stage about, about this book, Kacha uh, Gocha. Uh, so um, I think we decided the way we're gonna do it is, uh, with, uh, Jayant and I are gonna um, uh, uh, ask uh, Vivek uh, various things about this book uh, in turn, and I, I think that might, might work best. So I'll, I'll get the ball rolling um, by asking you first about the title, because it's the first thing that, that, that meets us, um, it's the first thing that we would have to say, and I, of course, um, um, I, met, I, met the, I should also say that the book has been beautifully translated by Srinath Perur. Um, I, that's, that's it's very important to see. So, and I, <laughs> I met Srinath while he was working on this book. And uh, we didn't talk about his work on the book, but he told me the name uh, of the book, uh, Ghachar Gujar, and I just sort of nodded sagely as if I knew what that meant. Um, I didn't. And then I didn't feel so stupid later because I, I discovered that this is actually um, a term that Vivek has made up. So, you know, all Canada speakers can feel quite reassured by, by that ignorance. So, so just starting briefly with, with, the, with the title, um, why, Ghachar Gocha, why have you made up this title? And also, it's quite rare for a translated, uh, translated work for the author and the translator to be allowed to give this kind of a title. Normally, uh, publishers would insist that the title be in English. Um, so, um, so, so why, basically? Thank you, Mahesh, for uh, that lovely introduction. See, the, uh, the word or the phrase Ghachar Gocha is something that uh, it's a nonsense word, actually. It did not exist till I created it. And uh, it is, if you want to understand what it is, you have to read the novel, really. Yeah, I can't explain it. And the reason uh, I uh, created it is because the whole novel is about something that uh, 
cannot be put in in things and words that you already know. You have to create something new to understand, to perceive what that uh, experience is, and hence this this new word which did not exist. And about your question, Mahesh, about um, the publishers, I think anyone who reads the novel understands that this is a perfect uh, you know, title for it. Yeah, and uh, we have had uh, no problems not, not only in India, but also this book is uh, will be published in the in the US in uh, next year uh, by Penguin. Incidentally, this is the first Kannada book to be published uh, uh, in the US, and they are going to keep the same title. So I think it, uh, if you understand, uh, if you read the novel, it, it makes a lot of sense that it's uh, and, and you know that it's an appropriate title. everybody. It's a pleasure to be here uh, at the launch of uh, my dear friend Vivek's book, Achar Gochar. Uh, it has become a neat word for us, you know, for everything we use that word now, Achar Gochar. So thank you, Mahesh, for starting the session. Uh, today I, we heard that uh, bilingual writers in bilinguality just half an hour ago here. I think this book is trying you in a because uh, there are some writers in Kannada, maybe in other languages also. We speak one language at home, like he speaks Konkani at home. I speak Konkani at home. Yeshwan Chital speaks, used to speak Konkani at home. He is no more. Girish Karnad speaks Konkani at home. Bendra used to speak Marathi at home. Uh, Kailasam spoke Tamil at home. Masti spoke Tamil at home. But they wrote in Kannada. We all write in Kannada. So it's a very interesting uh, thing. There is a tonality of Konkani language which seeps into our Kannada. So then suddenly people feel like Yashwan Chittal was the pioneer like that of a you know, fiction writer, Konkani fiction writer writing in Kannada. So when we started writing, Vivek and myself, everybody thought you are deeply influenced by Yashwan Chittal. Actually you were influenced by Konkani. <laughs> See, see, that is a very interesting thing. So, now that has gone into English. So, it's very interesting, you know, I was reading his Kannada, I read him in Kannada, but I read it in English also. It's a very, it sounds very different again in English. So, it's a very nice uh, journey for his uh, sensibility to travel from Konkani to Kannada to English. So, I just wanted to ask, you know, uh, this, you know, being a Konkani, because you have a very rare uh, ambience in your novel or, or all of your stories. The Konkani domesticity and Konkani domesticity of people not a, a teacher, Konkani businessman domesticity, like people who have shops, they come home, people who do business, they come home, people who sell vegetables, they come home. So the so-called business community, Konkanis are called as nomads, we came running uh, from uh, Calcutta, this side, and from even Kashmir side, we came to Goa, then we again ran down south. There's an interesting novel by Gopal Krishnupai about the exodus of Konkanis. The interesting detail is why Konkanis ran from here down south is to protect their gods. They left everything, their house, everything they left, but they had the idols linked to their chest and they ran in the forest. Actually, it should have been another way, that God should have protected them. <laughs> but, see, see, these people have, so, so all the time, the temples which you see in the interiors are those protected gods by the companies. So, uh, a kind of a domesticity, sticking to your, however bad the situation, however the testing time is, sticking to your, um, you know, fish curry, sticking to your particular kind of, uh, you know, wakarane, what you call. Tadka, tadka. Whether it is a Lasun Tadka or there will be a Sasam Tadka. There will be big wars about that. But it was a way of sticking together in testing times. These detailing, you know, domestic details holding you together in testing times. 
And recently, uh, there was a, uh, his novel, Uru Bhanga, is, is quite a good novel, which is very recently released. By reading that novel, I realized that your main, always your, you know, your work on hand, uh, it, the, the essence of it is, it's always oscillation between uh, un restructurable memory and unstructurable present. The present is there, which cannot be, you know, you can't give, but there is a memory, you restructure it, almost like a politics uh, of memory. In politics of memory, what you choose to remember uh, always signifies what you choose to forget also. So that kind of a matrix is in your work. So, I mean, how much is of this is conscious and how much is this as a, the process which you discover while writing? Thanks, Sajja. First, uh, let me talk about this company and Canada and uh, now the English uh, translation. I think it is, uh, I feel that my writing in Canada, it has got an edge over uh, uh, others and, and uh, other writing is because of Konkani. Because there are, there, it's another world. Yeah? And as you know, I don't have to tell you that the, each language has you know, so much uh, uh, integrated with, with that experience. So all the time I am perceiving my life, my experiences in, in two different languages. And I'm uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, and in fact three, not just two, because my work life is all English last 30 years. So it is, it is these three languages in which uh, I think and in which I, uh, you know, uh, experience and, and so it has all helped uh, uh, to shape my language. And I think in, in the morning where I was uh, talking to Mahesh and he was asking me about a proverb and he said, what does it mean in Karana? And I told him it's, it's not a Karana proverb, it's, an, it's a Konkani proverb. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, as Jain said, it's translated twice. Uh, coming back to what you said about experience uh, and uh, how real it is or how I, I remember uh, yesterday I was talking to Janavi and I was uh, telling her about uh, uh, about a, a Tamil folk, folk story which uh, David Shulman has mentioned in his book uh, called More Than Real and it's a very interesting uh, story. It's about uh, uh, a Brahmin who wants to build a house for uh, Shiva and he is uh, he goes around collecting money and, and but he realizes uh, soon that it is not possible to you know gather that kind of resources and uh, then he starts uh, building a temple in his mind and uh, he builds it brick by brick and it takes uh, him over a year to build the temple and at the same time the king of that area has also built a temple and uh, he decides a day for uh, you know inaugurating the temple and uh, he, he decides a date and then on that night uh, Shiva comes in his dream and tells him that he can't come on that particular day because he's engaged uh, with some other appointment. And uh, he says, and then uh, he says in such a such place this person has constructed a temple and I need to be there on that day. And King is, uh, you know, he is uh, uh, happy at the same time very curious to know that how is it, you know, somebody in his kingdom has built a temple without his knowledge. And he comes to that place and and, find, and uh, makes inquiries and doesn't find anything. And finally, he traces this person and realizes that the temple that he has constructed is uh, only in his mind. And uh, then he uh, and that that's that's the story. So you talked about you asked me about uh, you know how much of that is real or unreal. It's uh, I feel that once I write, uh, that is uh, that is real to me. It's it's my experience. Whether I have actually gone through that experience, whether I was present there, not present there, it really doesn't matter because the kind of intensity with which uh, uh, I write or, or any, any other, for example, any other writer, at the end of it, it is, uh, uh, I can't say it is not my experience. Yeah, so it's, it's important for me that uh, whatever is there is, you know, and there's a pleasure of writing because uh, otherwise, why would I write if I have to write uh, what I already know and if I can't experience what I write? Yeah, so that's the that's whole uh, point of writing. Yeah, I 
I remember again Ishwan Chittal, whom you have dedicated this book. One of the finest uh, writers, uh, Anand Murthy, Lankesh, Ishwan Chittal, Shantinath Desai. Those were the people who groomed our sensibilities. So he often said this, uh, like, I don't write what, what I know, I write to know. <laughs> See, that, uh, that becomes a very catchy line for, you know, youngsters when I tell. Another thing he used to tell is, uh, we are not born human, we are born to be human. And literature is a way towards that, uh, this thing. So, uh, has Chittal influenced you in any way, objectively, if you look at your works? And uh, uh, Because he was working in a corporate uh, world in Bombay, he lived in Bombay for 50 years, and uh, he lived and died in Bombay, he wrote about Bombay, and about corporate uh, uh, aggression, and how man exploits another man in a corporate world. And uh, now you are from a corporate world. You also, maybe of a different uh, generation. So like the writers from different ways of uh, these uh, working areas, because otherwise in Canada we had only lecturers and teachers writing, English lecturers and uh, Canada lecturers. And they have always had a fight, you know, because always Canada lecturers felt uh, English lecturers were more <laughs> well read and this thing. So that was, that problem used to be there. But now suddenly the people from various working areas are coming because your Huli Savari story was a major story in Canada where um, it's about a corporate uh, theme. So corporate world and changing times, Yashwan Chittal, you, Canada, what do you feel? Now I must share, uh, of course Yashwan Chittal has influenced me a lot in, uh, it's difficult to say who has influenced but I must share uh, something uh, that uh, Changed the way I looked at uh, literature. Uh, it was uh, I was about 17 years old, and that's when I first came in contact with uh, Yashwan Chittal. I used to read a lot, and I read his stories. And at that time, uh, I was reading indiscriminately. And in my mind, I wanted to be a writer, by the way. And in my mind, at that time, it was like you know, to be a writer, one has to travel the world. You know, it was. Uh, and I somehow felt it's it's not enough if you just know what is around you. And when I started reading Chitta, his stories were all, you know, uh, the details of a small village and, and, and the places that were familiar to me. By the way, I also come from the same uh, part uh, of, of Karnataka, from where Chitta is. So it was, uh, it was suddenly an eye-opener eye to me. And uh, I was very excited to, to see that. And I contacted him. And it so happened that he visited his hometown, and which is called Hanehalli, and it appears in almost all his works. And then he said, I will take you to Hanehalli with me. And as I said, I was 17 year old and I, I went with him and it was a great experience. There is a story by Chittal called Abolin. And it is a story about uh, how uh, a person in, in that village exploits a young girl of uh, 15, 16 year old, telling her that, uh, uh, that he ha he kisses her and tells her that now you are pregnant and the, and the a girl is so innocent that she believes it and then uh, uh, she marries him or, or rather you know she's forced to marry him because when asked are you pregnant she says yes but she doesn't know what it means and it's a beautiful story and uh, in that story there is a there is a scene where the father of that girl uh, goes to a church and and, and talks to uh, the priest there and then he comes down those steps very heavy heart. You know, this beautiful description of that. And when we went, uh, he showed me, look, this is uh, that church, you know, and these are the steps. And, and I was uh, in fact <laughs> devastated because what was in my mind like a huge church and, and uh, you know, those endless steps, there are only three steps and with a small church there. Yeah. But it, it was such a lesson. Of course, there are other details, and then there is another story in which uh, uh, an old man called Wooden Saab walks from one end of the village to the other end, and that is the whole story. And the story is about death and his the path that he travels, the, the you know that, that evening. And uh, then there is a bridge that he that he describes, like, but that was only you know four and a half feet. <laughs> So I was uh, disappointed, but at the same time, I think it was a great lesson in what it means, uh, uh, what literature means, and how one transforms what you see, and, and uh, you know how what a metaphor is, 
and what it means and how those things get uh, uh, comes into literature and you know it was and I can't explain it but then it was like a uh, you know it was like uh, I don't know I can't even find a word to explain it but that is that is the influence and divorce uh, a family uh, that kind of a family they choose to ignore certain things and they choose to focus on certain things and all in the interest of the family because they 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 know they are living in modern times then they want to pick up something which helps them to protect themselves and they ignore some things which uh, are not very comfortable to them you know so that was the uh, point um, i i did ask vivek uh, if he would like to to read from the book um, but he said that he's He's not terribly comfortable reading reading from the book, but he he asked me if I would if I would read um, a passage, and I I felt that someone should read from this book because it, it really is it really is lovely, and just to give you um, a flavor of the kind of writing that, that we're talking about. So I'm just going to read um, uh, a short passage um, that that is quite key to the book. Um, it, it also goes back to what I was saying about the cover, the cover which I showed you, which has a, a, a plate of a, a plate. Um, Used plate with a with a colony of ants um, over it, and um, this this there's a scene that appears fairly early on in the book where where the, the the family that we've been talking about they live in their small house um, uh, in Bangalore and they're um, affected by an invasion of ants and 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 this is this is those uh, few paragraphs. Amma resorted to chemical warfare, all sorts of powders and poisons. She made a dough from flour and gamaxane powder and sealed cavities behind which the ants were suspected of having their hideouts. Whether this killed any ants or not, it at least prevented Amma from feeling entirely powerless. The rest of us too were hardened by strife. It became a reflex to reach out and squash a stray passing ant. On someone's advice, Amma started treating the house with neem smoke. An old tin box was reserved for the purpose. About once a week, burning coals would be tipped into it over a base of sand and handfuls of neem leaves thrown in. It produced thick smoke. Amma covered her nose and mouth with the end of her sari and took the fuming box around the house, letting it linger in corners and behind the cupboard. Once, I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet and found Amma in the kitchen. She was on her haunches, facing the wall tracing the path of a line of ants using a flashlight. Now, unlike rats and cats, ants don't make things fall in the night and wake people up. I can only imagine the clamor they must have created in her mind. At one stage, she even went around meeting officials and got the corporation to fog the neighborhood. It's impossible to say whether it made a difference. We still had ants. We had no compunction towards our enemies and took to increasingly desperate and violent means of dealing with them. We'd flatten them with our hands or feet or books wherever we saw them. If we noticed that they'd laid siege to a snack, we might trap them in a circle drawn with water and take away whatever they were eating. Then watch them scurry about in confusion before wiping them off with a wet cloth. I took pleasure in seeing them shrivel into black points when burning coals were rolled over a group of them. When they attacked an unwashed vessel or cup, they'd soon be mercilessly drowned. I suppose initially we did these things only when we were alone, but in time we began to be openly cruel to ants. We saw them as demons come to swallow our home and become a, became a family that took satisfaction in the destruction of ants. We might have changed houses since, but habits are harder to change. Another scene in this novel, which is you know, which is very very favorite scene of mine, like trailer, I am showing it to you so that you can buy the book once you <laughs> go out of this. Uh, there is a scene where the wife has gone to Hyderabad. She has left him. She has deserted him. And he's, first time he's opening her cupboard and just, you know, that entire thing, her world is there concealed. It was just waiting for him to open that uh, door. Her sari, her bangles, her ornaments and spin, all, all the things. And there's collected uh, perfume, the fragrance there. So he wants to inhale that. But when he goes to an Indian object, 
fragrance to go away. If he goes, he takes a hold of the sari. If he tries to hold a sari and try to inhale it, that fragrance goes distant. Moment he goes away from all those things, he can feel it. But moment again he goes to an individual bit, it goes. So I find it a very interesting uh, metaphor, even how to approach a piece of art also. You know, like it's a, it's a collective ambience, collective tone, whatever it is. And uh, more you try to you know separate, analyze, and take it out, and you you lose it. So that's the most beautiful uh, part of it, uh, this novel. And another thing is, if I had. I was the editor, consulting editor of this novel. I would have given a different title to this novel. It would be Art of Leaving. <laughs> because every character leaves from the home in this. Everybody leaves. The, so most of the, uh, see so many characters, they just come and they leave. They leave, they just leave, they're an exit. Nirgamana. So, and it's a very intriguing absence, it's felt. And there's a fear which holds people together. A fear uh, of becoming party to that exit. Uh, that one fear, unsaid fear, holds the family together. And we are usually, we, we know, I mean, like fear of known and fear of unknown words. But here there's a fear of knowing. There is possibility. If I put a step ahead, I might know, but let me not know it. See, that kind of a zone, this uh, uh, novel uh, moves. So it's very, very uh, evocative and very disturbing because it talks about uh, money in a different way. The money which has affected us uh, and sense of identity, struggle for survival, a nomadic kind of a uh, feeling that uh, you know holds this novel. So I compliment, compliment you Vivek for this and uh, keep writing. I must say something about the translation because uh, the point that Anju mentioned in the previous session, uh, Srinath has done an excellent job and it is, uh, uh, it is, translation is something that one has to create that work in another language. It is not just finding an equivalent, uh, you know, word or a sentence or, it is, it is to find the tone and uh, it takes uh, a lot of energy and uh, effort and unless somebody is so passionate and involves, uh, you know, oneself in it. It is, it is not possible. So getting that tone right is the most important thing. Is you know, that's what I feel. And uh, whoever has read this translation has appreciated it a lot. And, and I also feel that you know this is uh, one of the best translations of uh, my work. And and it has taken a long time for uh, Srinath to, you know, arrive at this. So I also thank him uh, for that and, and being with me all through. And we have, of course, in, in worked on it together. And in some places, you know, he wanted to change a word or a sentence, or so that it. Uh, uh, so and, and that I think has also given him more flexibility to work uh, because it's different to work within uh, with, with the author rather than a, you know uh, if you have uh, no one to consult to if you want to make changes. So I try. Uh, not really. Not really. <laughs> yeah. Not really. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, this novel is about money. It's about money is at the heart of this novel, um, and, and it's quite Balzacian in that way, the way that money almost motivates every character and it sort of influences um, almost everything that happens in this novel, but it's also very profoundly about family. And, um, um, and, and, and the way that this family changed by, by uh, errant money. Um, so so th this is a family that, that, that was used to, to, to skimping, um, shall we? And there's, there's a sudden change of circumstances. Um, uh, and so they, they sort of move up the social rung, um, certainly the economic rung, into a kind of entrepreneurial class. Um, uh, but but the family is key to this, and and it's it's a joint family. They all, they, they live together in this in this house, but they all have very interesting and very subtle dynamics with each other. Um, there is an immense tension in it because one word or one deed or or an omission can suddenly change the relationship between different members of the family: the 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 the, the, the father, the patriarch, the, um, his wife, 
uh, the son, his um, his wife, and, and and the daughter. So it's very f- finely balanced. And, and when we were talking earlier, you said that the story, the idea for this novel, started with that family, and that they almost appeared to you sort of fully formed. I mean, is that is that right? Not really, in the sense, uh, not formed in, in that sense. It's very difficult to say how I arrived at this. Because it's like, a, you know, it's trying to identify from which stream what part of a river is formed. It's, it's, it's really difficult. But this is something that has, that has uh, been with me for a long time. And I had uh, dealt with this in some different ways in some of my stories. And uh, sometimes, you know, one has to wait for things to happen and then uh, one gets lucky. So I, I think there was that point in time where I, uh, where I found this and, and I did that. Uh, and also it's, uh, it's in the sense that it is, uh, it is set in uh, post-92, uh, you know, the globalized uh, uh, India that we, that we see today. So I, which, is, which is what, uh, uh, which is what uh, prompted me to Look at this uh, thing. So it's the various things which came together to uh, to to form this. And uh, the other thing is also that uh, uh, many of these things are details which uh, has come from my work life. You know, where uh, uh, I have worked in you know, small places and with uh, people who are uh, who have who are salesmen and who are, you know, that kind of uh, world that I have seen. So, various things, and also company family, and then many, many things have come together. Uh, one uh, last question from me. I have not written a novel yet. I have written poems, I have written short stories. I have started writing novels, then made them into short stories immediately after 10 days, not able to sustain the pressure. So you are a very successful and very significant short story writer. And now you are writing novels. So the fiction writer, so as a writer, any gear change, what are the different experiences? Of course, it's a long journey, evolving journey, absorbing journey, that's fine. But still, as a craftsman, do you think uh, is there what is very special that you enjoy when you write a novel and what you enjoy when you write a short story? I remember uh, a Canada writer called Shantana Desai used to tell me that writing a short story is like you climb a tree and eat that fruit. And writing a novel is like you, you know, uh, uh, move around a, a big farm and, you know, climb on, on whichever tree you want and pick up and eat whatever. So that's a kind of, uh, anyway, for me, I think novel has been, uh, I've written uh, three novels now, plus this one. This was a long story and, and you know, seen as a novel. Anyway, but I think it is uh, It is not that uh, I start writing a story and becomes a novel. It's, it's never, it's never, uh, never that way. And, and novel comes to me as a novel. And I find that the space that the novel offers is uh, something that is uh, that the short story does not offer in uh, to to capture that experience that uh, we have. So I think the time is up. I can talk about the novel writing for next one. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for being uh, with us. Today.